We'll continue on now, and Jennifer is going to give us some more of her insights into imaging data and some additional observations. Jennifer. Yeah, I switched topics on you. Um, feeling a little more cold feet about giving any thoughts about treatment to this crowd. So um, what I'm going to do is, um, you can knock me upside the head and that would be good. But So what I thought I would do though is I wanted to give you a little bit more um, continuation of, of where I was at it, yesterday's talk um, and give you just some of the imaging data um, and show you that the hyperactivity does indeed continue as you um, move up the pathway um, and just give you a little bit of the, the background of that and, and, and exactly what do we see. And then I can never resist sort of showing hot off the press, if you will, or findings that are evolving. Um, it's a great way of getting my ideas gelled and maybe getting some feedback and we're seeing some things in our, just our um, history data of our tinnitus subjects that I think is kind of tantalizing. So um, there'll be just two parts to this then. One is fMRI activation in tinnitus, specifically um, in the inferior colliculi and in auditory cortex, and then the subject history information that I just wanted to share with you. Um, so I just wanted to give you some background as to, as to what we're looking at when we use fMRI to look um, at activation in the brain um, in people with tinnitus. And um, the picture that I've been, I was showing yesterday repeatedly of the human auditory system is essentially, it resembles a slice that you would get through the brain if you were to image something like this. Um, and that's sort of where this, this came from. Um, and what's nice is that you can image a slice like this and, and do just what, is, what happens in this, this diagram. And then I just cut through pretty much the entire auditory pathway. Um, and then you can image this nicely. And actually, these are data from a paper first authored by the woman in the front row, Monica Hawley. Yeah, this is your paper. This is from your, I snarfed this from your paper. So, are you having trouble hearing? Okay. Is this, if I bring this closer, is that okay? Better? Sorry, I'm also working on a cold here, so I'm not talking at full volume. Okay. So, what you're looking at here is just typical fMRI data. Um, what's in the background is a grayscale image um, in, the, in, in the slice plane that I showed in the previous slide. Um, and it's designed to intersect the, um, pretty much the whole auditory system, and which you can see in color. And the color represents um, responses measured with fMRI, and particularly responses to a broadband noise stimulus presented to both ears. So in fMRI, what you do is, uh, it doesn't come off looking like this, this color picture. What you do is you, there's various paradigms, but one involves imaging repeatedly, say every two to eight seconds, depending on the paradigm you're using. In this case, presenting sound for, say, 30 seconds, and then turning it off and turning it on repeatedly. And then for each pixel in the image, you compare the signal strength during the on and the off periods. And then that's where the color maps come from. And you can essentially uh, uh, record the difference in signal um, as a p-value, and that's what's plotted here. So um, very um, high p-values or high activity, uh, pardon me, low p-values or high activity, and then um, a p-value of 0 0.01, as it turns out, is the blue. And so areas that aren't showing color were all tested for a difference in signal um, between the sound on and off conditions and showed none. And so what you can see is you can image um, all the way down from auditory cortex, inferior colliculus, um, cochlear nuclei, and even to some extent um, some of the smaller and more difficult um, to image centers, namely the superior olive and others. So um, what I'm going to focus on here um, is the, first the inferior colliculus and then the auditory cortex. Now, I'd like to give you a feeling for this technique and what it actually does. And so let me show you what's behind um, some of these colored areas in a little bit more detail. Um, that's what's shown here. So if we were to plot um, as a function of time the image signal um, before turning a sound on, after it's turned on, and then when it's turned off, you see something like this. 
you can see that, uh, first of all, what we're getting off the scanner are arbitrary units. With fMRI, you don't measure absolute le levels of activity, you measure changes in activity. So we can't, for instance, ask what's the spontaneous activity in the auditory pathway using fMRI, because um, we can't get absolute levels of activity. It's something you can do with PET, although that involves, to do that, you have to deliver a radioactive tracer. The other thing you can see is that this is sort of a sluggish onset to this sound compared to, say, an ABR, where you know within a millisecond you've got a response, and here you've got a response that takes seconds to build up. And that's because we're not seeing neural activity directly. We're seeing it through a chain of events. So in response to sound, neural activity increases. You have to have an increase in metabolism to respond to the neural increase. From that, you have an increase in blood flow. The blood flow has a consequence of changing the local oxygenation, and the local oxygenation perturbs the image. All right, So there's a big, long chain of events um, that lead to the signal change. So a typical way to quantify fMRI data, and you can indeed quantify it, you don't just have to look at color maps, um, is to take the percent change in signal. And that's what's shown here. Okay, And so what I'll show you later on are, are quanti quantified fMRI data um, where the quantification is in terms of percent signal change. Um, so anybody who's been in a scanner knows that there's huge amounts of noise, and so how can you possibly do a reasonable you know, auditory study? And you do it by, by standing on your head and doing a lot of contortions and um, basically sacrificing a lot of efficiency. And so one, one approach, I'm going to be showing you data that was where we used various approaches to manage the noise. One um, is called clustered imaging. And it basically involves imaging, say, 10 slices or more through the brain very quickly and then leaving a nice long quiet period, eight seconds or more. And I won't get into the details, but basically by keeping the time over which you're acquiring images short and then spacing the images widely apart, you can pretty much wash out the response to the um, sound that's produced during the imaging process itself. And just in case anyone doubts that handling the noise um, is important, this is showing data from um, one of the first studies that uh, basically um, showed this technique. There were sort of two that came out simultaneously, this one and one from Deb Hall's group in Nottingham. On the left, you're seeing responses to, in the, in the temporal lobe, um, to music as it turns out, but using clustered imaging. And on the right, it's using the same number of images, imaging the same number of slices, but not bunching the images up in time. So there's no sort of washout of the effects of the noise in between the imaging on, on the right-hand side. And so the, the lack of color here compared to here, and it's actually an imaging plane like this, so it's a little different from what I was showing you, three slices through the temporal lobe. But the lack of color on the right is just showing you sort of the saturation of the auditory system, its inability to respond to the sound because of the background noise, and the left is showing you the recovery of that ability to respond when you do your imaging um, the right way. So um, now let me get back to a picture I showed you yesterday um, to lead off, which is now getting into the application of fMRI to tinnitus. And this is showing, um, as I said yesterday, uh, images of the inferior colliculi, so right here. Um, in a person without tinnitus and a person with tinnitus. Broadband noise was presented to both ears in the paradigm that I just described to you. And, um, and now since you see more yellow here, you can see that there's more um, activation in this person with tinnitus than this person without. And so now to give you just a few more details that this isn't just a sort of a one-off, um, what you're looking at here on the top is data from the same study um, but now, the data in the inferior colliculi has been quantified in each person, each participant with tinnitus or no tinnitus. Um, the different symbol types are just indicating that different methods were used to manage the background scanner noise. Um, so this is our percent signal change measure that I just described. And each ball basically re represents a single subject. So the two colliculi have been, the data from the two colliculi have been averaged together. 
The picture I just showed you, the images uh, correspond to these points that are indicated by a star. So I took them sort of from the middle of the distribution about the median. And importantly, when you look across everybody, what you've got is still a statistically significant difference between the groups where the tinnitus subjects are on average showing um, greater activation than the control subjects. All right, but I'm also showing you the individual data. There's a lot of scatter, right? There's this dude down here, um, and there's this, oh, there's this person here, and this person here who are the same people, and who are me, tested on two different days, okay? There's a lot of variability in this measure, and I think part of it comes from the fact that we're looking at, there's such a long train of, chain of events from the neural activity to the thing that we're actually measuring here, that there's a lot of opportunities for there to be noise to be introduced, okay? And so one reason I talked to you yesterday about other techniques for measuring elevated activation in the pathway is because I'm not sure this is the greatest one to use if one's gonna go forward, for instance, and look at um, whether or not you can suppress hyperactivity using a particular intervention, okay? So maybe you wanna test whether or not a sound therapy has, uh, is, is able to actually reduce hyperactivity within the pathway, and I'm not so convinced that fMRI is the way to go in doing something like that. Something like the ABR might have more stability in repeated measures. But despite that variability, all right, we can still, when we take a group of subjects, we can see differences. I'm just not sure you wanna follow this measure longitudinally. And so what we've got as a proof of concept still um, is greater activity in response to sound in the people with tinnitus compared to without. And let's see, so what I haven't shown you yet is, is the hearing of the, the thresholds of these people. Um, and that's what's basically here. So just like everything I talked about yesterday, um, the subjects, the mean audiograms are all um, in the normal range, and the means for the control and the tinnitus subjects are quite close, not as closely matched. This is one of our earlier studies as our more recent work, but close nonetheless. So uh, as I, I also said yesterday, I, I never believe anything unless I can see it again and again. And so recently then we have more data where we went in and um, we, we just happened to be able to uh, add on some sound on-off paradigm uh, runs into our fMRI experiments, and we tested the left hand for replication. And so what you can see again is there's a general tendency for the tinnitus subjects to show more activation um, than the control subjects. So we have replication, and there's actually, um, here we've got matching um, demonstrated all the way up to 16 kilohertz between the controls and the tinnitus subjects. So the different line types, there should be a label here, um, it, the dashed are either the right or the left ear and the, and the, the solids are um, the opposite ear. Okay, so, so yes, there's definitely increased activation in the inferior colliculi in response to sound. When you look at these people with clinically normal, near normal hearing, evidence of hyperactivity. And if we move up the pathway to the auditory cortex, you can see signs of the same kind of thing. Um, so on the left-hand side is showing a side view of the brain. It's a reconstructed brain, um, computationally reconstructed from MR images like I showed you before, the grayscale ones. And you can also computationally remove the top part of the brain here and look down on the temporal lobe, and that's what you see here. So this is towards the nose, towards the back of the head, and this is Heschel's gyrus, this little bump here, this sausage. And basically, you can go in and quantify the different regions of auditory cortex again and test to see whether or not there's more activation in people with tinnitus than without. And uh, when we did that in this study, um, in this region, primary auditory cortex, the posteromedial two-thirds of Heschel's, we're again seeing greater activation. Um, forgot to put in a p-value, but it is actually significant. And this, again, replicates. I don't have the data to show you, but in that replication um, study that I just uh, showed you for the inferior colliculi. So you can see these things over and over again. Um, it's, but these are difficult experiments to do. Um, there's a lot you have to control. They're expensive. And I'm not sure, as I said, that they're better if you actually are trying to do something like follow people longitudinally over time and see what's happening to their physiology. 
So what we have, though, um, and for research purposes, those data are very important for this because it helps complete or extend the picture that I gave you yesterday. So where I ended was that there is hyperactivity um, that's ubiquitous um, in the lower auditory pathway and present in multiple subpathways of the auditory pathway, not just in one. And that continues to the inferior colliculi and is also present in auditory cortex. And I sort of just described it like that activity begins here and it moves its way up to the auditory cortex. And of course, it's equally possible that what's happening down here is driven from above. Um, we can't make that distinction. And in, in tinnitus research, I've learned the one thing you do is you don't dismiss any possibility because the least likely one is probably the one that's true. So, okay. Now, what we also have done is um, moved on and looked beyond the auditory cortex. And I'm just going to give you a little bit of sample, a sample of this. And I'm basically going to um, um, tell you right now that what I'm going to show you are some null findings, OK? And this actually picks up on something that, that Phil Gander mentioned yesterday, which is that it's been very difficult to use the method I'm about to describe to sort of come to firm conclusions about what's going on in tinnitus. Um, it, there's a widely used form of fMRI um, that involves, instead of presenting a stimulus and turning it on and off or having a person do a task, you just have them in its sort of its purest form lie in the scanner, you collect data over time, and then you look at the signal as a function of time in one part of the brain, and you cross-correlate in time that signal with voxels in every other part of the brain. And it's called a functional connectivity analysis. And if you have the person just lying in the scanner and doing nothing, it's called a resting state functional connectivity analysis. And so we decided, you know, we'd like to know what the auditory cortex is hooking up and talking to, what might be telling the auditory cortex to have this hyperactivity. Um, and so we did um, a set of resting state experiments. Now, when we do them, we do them actually a little bit differently than most people do. Um, we don't, usually there's no explicit, I'm sorry, just like other people, there's no explicit stimulation. However, unlike other people, we do actually provide a task. And that is basically because you've got a person with tinnitus, you've got a person without tinnitus. You want them to sort of be doing exactly the same thing in the scanner. However, um, you can't tell the person with tinnitus to not pay attention to their tinnitus, right? They're going to go into the scanner and they're going to pay attention to their tinnitus. So what we do is we tell everybody, controls and tinnitus subjects alike, to do a task that's just very simple. All right, We call it near resting state. And actually a number of groups, Dave Langers and others, have sort of adopted this. So they just sit in the scanner and they watch a cross that changes color every now and then. It basically changes color just often enough to keep you from falling asleep, and it gives you something to do. And it gives us a way of instructing the subjects. The tinnitus subjects may still be attending to their tinnitus, um, and the controls have no tinnitus to attend to, but it's a way of getting around sort of the uh, brain just doing whatever the heck it wants to do. All right, so what happens when we do this? Well, let's take a little bit of auditory cortex, a seed, um, in the left region, I'm, I'm in radiological coordinates. So this is an axial slice, um, and the do dotted lines indicate the uh, borders of Heschel's gyrus. So we're going to take that seed, take its signal, cross-correlate it with every other part of the brain, and what you can see comfortingly is that there is a lot of uh, correlated um, uh, correlations, basically, in the opposite primary auditory cortex. Okay, So both cortices are receiving inputs, common inputs from below. There's the corpus callosum that basically connects the two. So it's good to see that those two cortices are talking to each other. So the auditory cortex, though, is also talking to other areas that are part of one of the sort of at least two major um, networks um, that form a backbone, if you will, of functional organization of the brain, and one is the cognitive control network. So we have connections between auditory cortex correlations with supplementary motor area, pre-SMA, pre anterior cing cingulate as well. All right, so everything is kind of doing what you would expect, but I'll tell you there's no difference between people with tinnitus and without. And one of the things we firmly believe is that 
a solid negative finding is actually a very important thing. It tells us something. Um, it tells us something that about what is not happening. And um, so we've actually you know, done this set of experiments in a cohort of 30-some subjects. We've done it twice and not seen differences between people with tinnitus and without. So there's another uh, major network that um, one might speculate would be involved in tinnitus, and that's the network you see when you look not at the areas that are positively correlated with auditory cortex, but the ones that are negatively correlated, and that's what's shown here. So these are areas uh, including medial prefrontal cortex, parietal lobe, um, posterior cingulate precuneus. Um, this is showing negative correlations with um, auditory cortex. If we take a little piece of the precuneus um, and cross-correlate its activity everywhere, we see what's defined by these dashed lines. And this is basically a way of getting what's known as the default mode network. So one thing that's come out of imaging in the last 10 to 15 years is that, is that your brain's always doing something, okay? So when you're not doing the task that the experimenter told you to do in the scanner, your brain is defaulting to um, basically to activation or negative activation in the sites that are shown in the dashed line. And so one of the ideas that's been around in tinnitus, um, and I think there basically, at least with fMRI, there hasn't been any support for it, is that maybe tinnitus patients or tinnitus subjects never completely default and that there will be something amiss with the default mode network. All right, and at least with fMRI, that's not something that we see. Um, Okay, and we also don't see abnormal connections, basically, to that network. So, basically, um, this is the picture I'm going to leave you with. Um, we're not going to continue the story with connectivity. There's other findings and sort of disparate findings that are out there in fMRI using task, tasks instead of um, just resting state and looking at cortical centers. Um, you know, but as Phil mentioned yesterday, that sort of hasn't coalesced into a clear picture um, of replicable findings and sort of a centralized view of what's going on. So I'm not going to take you through it since I'm not sure I'm going to lead you to a uh, final convincing story. This, though, I feel pretty confident in. I do want to leave you, though, with a slight, with a caveat, and that is that you know, we have looked at this specifically in people with clinically normal, near normal hearing, who we consider to be essentially just at one end of the spectrum of all tinnitus subjects. But obviously it would be nice to extend this to the more typical tinnitus subject with a frank high frequency loss, for instance, or other forms of loss, and see whether or not this continues to apply. All right, so that's pretty much all I wanted to say on imaging, and now what I wanted to do is just share with you something that's sort of been an adjunct to what we've worked on. So we, we've worked on a whole series of studies to flesh out the picture I just showed you before and do other things. And um, in the process, we have certain questionnaires that we give people and measurements that we make. And um, we also have a questionnaire that is our catch-all bin of the things that we just kind of want to know about. And this is a questionnaire that's been growing and growing. Um, and it's mainly about the history of subjects. What's, what, what happened to them before they developed tinnitus? Um, how do they develop tinnitus? But really more just what happened to them and what were they exposed to in terms of sounds and so on. And so I'd just like to share this with you. Um, and as I said, partially just to get ideas and to see what people think. Um, but basically, um, what I'm going to show you is just data that we have on, you know, over the years we've studied hundreds of people. We've collected the data in a database. And these are basically some of the history items that people have responded to. And I'd just like to show you um, what the tinnitus responses look like compared to the control responses. So um, this is what we call phishing. And <laughs> I think actually, this is my way, just want to editorialize for a second. <coughs> In tinnitus, I think it's important to fish because any scientific anything begins with observations. And um, that's the reality. And from there, you can then form hypotheses and models and, um, and start to um, uncover things in a, in a more rigorous way. But first, you have to start with the observations. And um, so here's one observation. 
This is just sort of the most compiled form of all of the data, and it's showing basically the number of items, number of these items, that people without tinnitus and people with tinnitus reported. All right, so this is fraction of subjects, fraction of either control subjects or tinnitus subjects, and then this is the number of items. So what you can see is that our control subjects are reporting less stuff happening, all right? And our tins or tinnitus subjects are reporting more things. Some of these things you might expect, loud job, loud hobby, but that accounts for maybe two things, all right? There's other stuff going on. Now, a lot of things on this list you think of as, yeah, okay, we know people have head trauma, they get their bell rung, they have tinnitus, you know, maybe it never goes away. But the phrasing of these was, have you ever had a head injury? Okay, so some of these people are reporting a concussion from when they were a teenager. Or they're reporting, you know, they fell off the back of a truck when they were two, or something like that. So these are long past, in many cases, long past events. History of ear infections. This may have been, I was a kid, and I had a ton of ear infections. All right, so, so what we're seeing here is that there may be, and this is the way I think of it, is sort of a buildup a buildup to the development of tinnitus. Perhaps it has to do with some of these um, particular aspects of people's medical history that we happen to put on this questionnaire. Um, the differences are in, in a lot of these categories, for a lot of these different items, um, are significant in terms of how often they're reported by people with tinnitus and people without. Um, I don't think it's any surprise that having had a loud job or a loud hobby would show significant differences. As I said, it might not be surprising that these three, ear infections, sinus problems, and whiplash, show differences. But remember, these are not necessarily ear infections right before the tinnitus developed. Same thing with the sinus problems, and same thing with the whiplash, and same thing with the head injury. So we're at an eye and ear hospital, all right, and some of our people are patients, okay, and so we might have some bias. Um, towards having people who have had this, at least in our tinnitus group, who have had these kinds of things, ear infections and sinus problems. But we've got a huge fraction of people who have come in off the street, okay? So we don't, and one of the things that we're going to be doing next is actually looking how, at how people were recruited and then divvying up the recruitment route um, and, and re-looking at this, okay? So what do the people off the street look like? Um, the head injury bit here got us even more intrigued because it's actually one of the things that's most significantly different. Um, but the other reason is because when we started to look at other measures we had on these people, they started to show differences. So the minimum masking level in the tinnitus subjects with the head trauma is greater than in the people without head trauma. I don't have a way of thinking about that. The loudness discomfort level of the tinnitus subjects with head trauma is lower, significantly so, all right, compared to both control subjects and tinnitus subjects without the head trauma. Now, there's some differences in the audiograms, not at the frequency um, of the stimulus that was used to collect these data, and there's no sign of a correlation of the LDLs with these differences in threshold. Um, and I find it rather intriguing that there would be a reduction in loudness discomfort level, partly because when you get a concussion, some of the symptoms are sensitivity to bright lights or just to lights, sensitivity to sound. And I can't help but wonder if this is a, a residual, a leftover, basically, of, of a head injury from long ago. So, um, so there's some tantalizing things, I think, um, in these data. When we concocted this questionnaire and we started giving it, we weren't necessarily thinking we would see anything interesting. But I think an interesting next step would be to pursue some of this at a larger scale, um, perhaps a, an internet-based um, um, delivered questionnaire where you get a large amount of data on people's history going long past um, to determine whether or not there's other factors, not just the events that occurred right before the tinnitus, but things that happened long ago that may actually be important to the eventual development of the tinnitus. So basically tinnitus may be decades in the making, even when there is an apparent cause and effect relationship between an event and tinnitus onset. We usually think about, you know, a history of noise exposure as, as something that is creating tinnitus eventually. 
But I guess my point is we need, to, I think we need to look at other factors as also, uh, or other things as also being important factors. Um, so attention to past history of infections and trauma, uh, not just acoustic trauma, may be crucial to uncovering the true and complete etiology of tinnitus. Um, you know, I think I can't help but think about the, some of the latest revelations in Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's disease where, you know, inflammation, the inflammatory process gone awry has been thought to actually exacerbate Alzheimer's disease. Um, we know that head trauma, there's an inflammatory response to that. Infections, an inflammatory response. So could there be something going on here in tinnitus? It's wild speculation, but the only way we can start to sort of dig at that, I think, is to just get the data and make the observations. Um, so basically, I think some more fishing is worthwhile. And thank you for listening. That's it.